Hello again, Sarah. Hi again, Louise. Here we are. We both can hold up the book, Relinquished, Gretchen Sisson. We're on the chapters Cassie followed by Jordan. And these were two birth mother stories. And Mm -hmm. I like how she does. It's like anecdotal because we've had so much information already. Mm -hmm. I had to go back and reread some actually. And then it's just two short anecdotal stories, but they're both very powerful. They say a Mm -hmm. lot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right out the gate, a quote from Cassie. And these were, and by the way, listeners, if you're not reading along, um, these are told in first person. Like they must have talked on the phone to Gretchen or maybe wrote out their stories, mm-hmm. kind of an essay form. But um, right out the gate, Cassie says, I would have needed maybe a thousand dollars for my life to change. Just a very small amount of money would would have probably changed my entire world. It's really weird to think of that now. $1,000 and maybe she would have raised her own child. We, we discuss this all the time. It's it. So many people, it just comes down to that financial moment, healthcare. Mm-hmm. They don't know what's ahead for the grief and the loss they're going to feel. I thought about my uh, first mother, Linda, in that because she really just was cash poor. She had a decent job, but was young. And yeah. So when Cassie is going through this, she gets pregnant. She's 22. She had a boyfriend. Actually, was she not a little younger? I think. Mm. Was she? Now, maybe was, you're right. No, she was 22. I remember. Th- That's oh, yeah, right. 22. Yeah. 22 in college. Yeah. Yeah. And she acts. This is also sad. This part right here. Um, even though my family was is politically liberal. They're not liberal or open-minded when it comes to me to even consider parenting. I just felt like I would need their support and I knew I didn't have it. They were extremely supportive of the adoption though. They were like, it's so smart and mature. What a great decision, which is pretty much what everyone told me. I think they were really happy and relieved that I they wouldn't have to help me. I wonder if after reading this book or maybe knowing more about how Cassie felt afterwards. I wonder I if they'd change their minds. Yeah. Because they may, she mean she didn't really go to them with, I would like to try because she was right. so scared of their, of the shame. She said for their scorn and disdain, if I failed them. And then huh. when she, then, you know, the, and the agency just, oh. God, what a nightmare agency just, you, yeah. You know, they didn't talk to her about any other options. It was all adoption all the time. Yeah. And, and then how, there was, how great then she said it, it wasn't overt coercion, coercion, but there was still coercion. They gave me this worksheet divided into two columns labeled things I can provide for my baby and things adoptive parents can provide for my baby. I, I thought that was just. A, oh, my a God. That is so blatant. Malarkey, as my relatives used to say. Yeah, that's just like, I'm sorry. How? gross because obviously when you're struggling and young, you see, Oh, and then they had her immediately look at books of potential parents who look wealthy and, and together and which of, and she was feeling, what did she say? I felt so low about myself and I don't want to bother the parents too much. If it's an open adoption, should I, you know, cause they asked her, do you want one year or two years of five years of letters? Like, like she was a bother. Right. Well, oh, she yeah. certainly felt that after she mm. met them. Um, yes. And then she also said, you know, a lot of the adoptive parents were just different people. They were religious or straight laced. And she wanted to have, she aspired to have someone like her, but better. Mm-hmm. Oh, better. And she was a people pleaser. She said, I mean, uh, actually I felt, you know, very much that I probably would have been the same at that age. Maybe not right at that age, but a little bit younger for sure. I always thought if I had gotten pregnant, I would, you know, it's like that you are a people pleaser. You don't want to let anybody down. And now it's just like the feelings of losing that baby that you really become. She didn't know she'd really be a mother. She really didn't even know if she wanted kids. And she's like, I do. I'm a mother and my child's gone. That's hard. And she went into uh, a deep depression. Also, she really, you know, they were, um, like a journalist and a fashion designer. So yes. she was kind of intimidated by their, you know, in awe of their. Yeah. How cool they were. I mean, she was in college. She was 22, you know, I don't know. Just the whole, it just, 
made me sad, then she did have second thoughts. And, you know, yeah. that's the thing. And I think that the, yeah. the adoption agencies know that the hormonal stuff, you know, that's why they get the signatures and get that baby away from yeah. those mothers right after yeah. birth, you know, because you don't know until you know, you, you know? know, no, you don't then, know you're holding this baby or you're, you've and had the like, baby. Wait a minute, this is my baby. I thought what was interesting. And I wondered what happened with my, um, my mother's case is that right away she was so important until she had the baby. Right. And then what, that's there, what she says here. Um, she had no contact, absolutely none with mm -hmm. the parent, you know, when the baby, after the baby was born. Um, and then the, the agency did not reach out to her. She, and they were all, all like, over her before that every day contacting all her. over. Yes. It's just, <laughs> it's oh like, gosh, wipe your hands. Here, here's what she says later. And um, then, by, oh, but the, before that, they, you know, they mm -hmm. came, she did get to see him at two and a oh, half right. because they adopted another child. I'd love to know who these people are. <laughs> um, the same thing. I wonder who it is. <laughs> and then she said, um, after all of this, it, it's how long has it been now? I think miles, her son is eight when this was written and she hadn't seen him since he was five, I believe. And then she said, I do feel differently about adoption before everything. I was like, Oh, it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know about adoption was from the media and everyone says it's great. So that's what I thought too. My experience completely changed that for me. Now I find the media story is pretty problematic. She, yeah, she cites Juno, which we've, <laughs> we've talked about, you know, that, that it's no big deal. Juno was off riding a bike and after, yeah. right after, you know, it's yeah. Right. <laughs> here, here's what I was talking about, you know, about, you can't make that choice when you're pregnant and it's such a crisis moment in this state, mm -hmm. you can sign your termination of parental rights 24 hours after birth and the agency workers pretty much make you do it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. They don't encourage you to wait. They don't encourage you to think about it after. If I could go back, I just wish I would have waited a couple of days because I wouldn't have made the same choice. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. This whole chapter, I was just thinking about, Oh my God. I know. Makes you know, my own son. Yeah. And like, what if you were just, and you're, you're caught between all these people and you're doing the right thing. And then you don't want to, you want to speak up and you can't. And, and then you realize I, I should have, and I could have, and you, you don't. And it's, I don't know. It's very upsetting. <laughs> and she was, and then she talked about, you know, she didn't feel like a therapist would help because the, she felt like therapists would have the same narrative about adoption, you know, yeah. that thinking it's a wonderful thing. So she really didn't have anywhere to turn all that said. So she, and she and her boyfriend yeah. stayed together and had a baby, Amelia. Old daughter. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I she's, know. you know, she'll stay open to him. Yeah, she says, down. I honestly think that's something that should be left up for him to decide, you know, maybe someday if I ever do talk to him, he can tell me what he feels. Mm -hmm. Gosh. <laughs> well, we know we've talked to a lot of adoptees. We, I feel like we know what he'd feel one day. We're, we're going to know what he's, yeah. Might take yeah. him a while. It might take and him. We get to Jordan who, uh, had given it. So by the time Gretchen talked to her, so this was 20, Jordan had given up her son, like in 2019, I guess mm -hmm. Jordan had grown up in foster care, moving from home to home before ending up in a group facilities and aging out of the system. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan was homeless when she found out she was pregnant. And then that kind of spurred her to like, oh, I'm going to, I thought I'm Jordan did a great job. This baby. Yeah. She cared about her. She went to the prenatal visits, got it um, healthcare got a job and was wanted to keep her baby. Yeah. Um, and then but had an unfortunate incident, you know, and this is what happens to people <sighs> like, and then, you know, and she was from foster care. And, um, she, the, her boyfriend's ex, I guess. Yeah. Like got in a fight with her, got in a fight. And then she called the police before Jordan could. And so Jordan went to jail and then, yeah. And in jail, which was interesting. She had her, um, she had healthcare in jail. She had 
some nice things in jail, but she couldn't figure out the prenatal care. Yeah. Yeah. Prenatal, and she actually was in a calm situation to keep going towards motherhood. But then how do you leave jail? Now you don't have your job. Now you don't have the money. That's really, there's no support once again. Right. Once again, money. Well, and she, then COVID hit, you know, yeah. so it was just, just one thing, the domino effect, you know, this yeah. is, this is what happens in the cycle of poverty. It just, you just, it's hard to get out. And then of course there aren't resources to help with her with that. Certainly resources to get her baby, but not yeah. resources to help her get on her feet. This is just, uh, you know, you know, the, um, the title of this book we've talked about before, but my husband was watching me read and finish up <laughs> for, our, and he said, Oh, what, what's the rest of the the title here. And I said, well, I kind of told him about these two women in a short. And I said, the privilege of American motherhood. Right. I never really realized what a privilege it is in such an expensive country with all these things to have a child, you know, other places are just more supportive and different, but it really is who gets to raise that child, who has the, you know, what do we support as a society, honestly? And, and it- and here, let's talk about that word privilege mm-hmm. for a second, because why, just because you can't have your own mm-hmm. child, what gives you the right or the privilege to have somebody else's baby? Yeah. It, it's just to take somebody else's baby. And again, you know, people are unaware and they're not, they're not. Yeah but there's information out there. Now there's this book, there's American baby, there's the baby thief, mm-hmm. there's girls who went away. You know, now those are all earlier eras. This is current. There's well, adoptee even... voices out there. Yeah. Pay attention people. Like yeah. listen to what you're being told and, and there's got to be some changes anyway. Yeah, it is. It's, this is, this book is going to keep hitting us over the head. <laughs> I know. Every, every time there's a nugget, I mean, well, when Jordan, you... Jordan I guess had a little, yeah. uh, for an experience with the adoption agency who, and, she and did. she had decided she wanted, um, an LGBTQ couple cause of just her own situation. Of I think, she, what did she say? She was bisexual and she was, uh, she was color. So she wanted mm-hmm. co- uh, parents of color. So she, one of them was the thought she had two fathers mm-hmm. um, who, you know, in, in terms of like how an adoption could go, sounds like it's the best it could possibly have gone. They were, they've been really open. They've been really be open and really it. communicative. Yeah. Like, really included her, not just the little details and milestones, but she had six visits a year. They wanted her to know. I thought, you know, this is maybe also, so people listen, what open really means is not just here's some detail of once a year and drift off right. with letters. It really means she's involved in their lives. Yep. So far, you know, you know, there's something, there must be something I could get reamed for saying this, but there must be something about a competition between the adoptive mother and the birth mother. Cause these are two men that didn't feel that way and were totally open. And yeah, they felt very you know, like, excited to know her and, and competition might not be the right word, but a threatened, you know, threatened yeah. to have the birth mother around. I mean, I think that maybe is the difference in, yeah. you know, I don't know. I'm speculating. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I thought the same thing actually, when I was reading it, well, the next time we get into some bigger, stuff again. Yeah. We've got a long chapter coming up. People who are reading along with us, we've, we're going chapter two, choosing life. Um, so that's our next one. If you're reading along with us. This is going to be big. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they all are, aren't they? They all are. Well, stay tuned for Valerie. This story is really. Wow. Valerie's really got a story. She does. Really interesting talk about determination. Boy. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in a minute. Yeah. See you in a minute.